Okay, chapter 21 about safety. Safety is priority number one in everything that we do. So a lot of test questions come back down to patient safety and which one's going to keep a patient safe. Again, the disclosure statement, I don't own this material under fair use. I'm providing lecture content only to my nursing students and all content within is for educational purposes for nursing students and not to provide medical advice. So safety is the condition of being safe from undergoing or causing hurt, injury, or loss. It's a basic human need. And the nurse attends to the safety needs of clients in healthcare settings, healthcare workers, including themselves. So always remember when you go into your BLS course that they said, stop, check the scene, make sure it's safe to enter first. That's your first priority. You don't want to be going into a puddle of water with a down power line because now there's two patients and you're useful to nobody. So remember that at all costs, you have to protect yourself first. So when you're going into an isolation room, you put on your mask. You want to save yourself first. Developmental factors infecting safety. So like an infant toddler, they can't recognize danger, so you're doing that for them. They are tactile. They love to feel everything in their environment, and they're totally dependent on you. That's what makes them such at risk. Preschoolers, again, play extends to the outdoors, and they become more adventurous, so you really have to watch them. In the school age child, they're trying new activities without practicing first. They spend more time outside the home, which leads to stranger danger. So that's when we're teaching them about stranger danger. Adolescents um, have a false self of confidence and they feel indestructible. So there are more risk-taking behaviors going on during adolescence. And most lack the adult judgment. So instead of thinking with the front of their brain, they're thinking with their reptilian brain. And that's why you hit your head and you think teenagers, ugh. That'll remind you where they're, they're thinking with their brain. Adults could be injured in the workplace. Their lifestyle choices impact their health. So smoking, drinking, using drugs. Some decline in strength and stamina and others maintain their fitness. The older adult is losing muscle strength, joint mobility, they're slowing down the reflexes and their sensory losses. So that's why we start talking about taking away the keys. Um, sensory loss um, could be loss of sight, loss of hearing, those kind of things. In meeting the safety needs of the adolescent, it would be important for the nurse to focus their teaching on smoking cessation, sports injury, alcohol abuse, or driver's education. What do you think we're going to do with an adolescent? What's most at risk? What would they be trying out? So adolescents should be, so alcohol abuse, an adolescent isn't 21. So just keep that in your mind. When you answer some of these kind of questions, you have to think what they're supposed to be doing, not what they might be doing. So it's driver's ed. Adolescence is the time where motor vehicle accidents are the highest. Individual factors that affect safety might be their lifestyle, their cognition, their sensioperceptual status, ability to communicate, mobility status, physical and emotional health, and safety awareness. Safety hazards in the home. So when we're talking about home, we're thinking big places like underneath the cabinets where the chemicals are, lead paint, medicines, cosmetics. So the prevention always around this stuff is cabinet locks, store poisons high, 
keep the poison control number available. And depending on the type of poison um, ingested, having antidotes, charcoal, and so forth available. Most of the time, the answer is going to be get them to the ER right away. I will tell you that, what's it called, Ipecac syrup is never the answer. Ipecac syrup, do not do it. Most of the time, it's a chemical that shouldn't be coming back up. So if you give them the Ipecac syrup, it'll make them throw up. If at anything, you should probably give them charcoal because that's going to bind the substance in their stomach. At the end of the day, number one is call poison control. So safety hazard in the home, also thinking carbon monoxide poisoning. So a lot of the test questions might be around gas, wood, oil, or kerosene burning fuels. And the prevention would be a carbon monoxide detector. And you treat any carbon monoxide poisoning with 100% humidified oxygen. So even if their oxygen set is 93, if the test question says anything about oxyhemoglobin level, oxycarbi-oxyhemoglobin level, one oxygen, one carbon is carbon monoxide. So always be thinking 100% humidified oxygen in those test question scenarios. Scalds and burns, again, hot water, grease, sunburn, cigarettes, it could be any of these. The prevention is guardrails by fireplaces, turning in pot handles, especially around kids, care with candles so they don't cause a fire, and sunscreen. Care when warming food in the microwave. You've got to know these because they love to ask sunscreen questions on the test. And the sunscreen questions usually come down to the number of SPF, a minimum of 15. Fires, cooking fires, smoke inhalation, home heating equipment. Again, smoke alarms, caution with cigarettes. Fire extinguishers, know how to do the pass, know how to do race. So if you need to look those up, please do. Um, they're always on the test. No candles being left unattended, safety with holiday lights, and care with electrical cords. All kinds of test questions on that. Falls, um, over 65, we're really worried about falls. So we do a lot around slippery floors, stairs, tubs a low toilet seat, and a high bed. So just things to think about. Prevention, non-skid shoes, tidy clothes, proper lighting, grab bars, rails, and no scatter rugs. I love to call them trip rugs so that you remember that. So no trip rugs in the area. The other thing is to also remember that lighting that's really, really high lighting in an area where someone doesn't have good eyesight can actually look like wet water on the floor. So it's not usually bright lights, it's dim lights. Firearm injuries, obviously youth suicide, suicide, and domestic violence, so firearm safety, encouraging proper locked storage and ammunition separate from the guns. So we hear about these almost every day. Um, Inadvertently, the child gets a hold of the gun and it's loaded. Suffocation, asphyxiation, um, the drowning, choking, smoke, gas inhalation. Most kids that are at risk are zero to four because if you think about it, smoke is going to go to the floor. Fire is going to go to the ceiling. So they are more at risk. Watch for small removable parts on things that they could choke on. Cut food into tiny pieces. We'll come back to this in pediatrics. Pay attention to mobiles, strings, cords, and plastic bags for suffocation risk. Apply a barrier to a pool, which means a fence, and know how to do the Heimlich maneuver. Take home toxins. So things at home like microorganisms from work, we take them home. Asbestos, lead, mercury, arsenic, be aware of workplace preventative measures, 
remove your work clothing out in the garage, shower if appropriate, and use gloves. So a clicker check. A child has had hiccups for two hours. This is a suspected ingestion of poisoning. Hiccups do not occur with poisoning. Hiccups would not be a poisoning issue. Motor vehicle injuries. So that has to do with um, using seat belts, use of alcohol, pedestrian accidents, and non-deployment of an airbag. Avoid distractions like cell phone, text messages, and loud music in the car. Use a designated driver if you're going to drink. Use seat belts and proper age-dependent restraints for children. So backwards till two. Safe hazards in the community. Foodborne pathogens, vector-borne pathogens. So when we talk about this, it's food poisoning. So the proper f storage, cleaning, and cooking of foods. Cleaning, cook, <laughs> clean cooking surfaces and attention to folk remedies. Drain all standing water, use insect repellents, protect skin, contact with insects, and wipe out breeding areas. So standing water. Pollution, air, water, noise, soil, proper disposal of solid waste, like paint, car batteries, buy only environmentally safe products, Carpool, use public transport, or use hearing protection. Weather hazards, be aware of weather events, develop a disaster plan, and identify a place to take shelter. Safety hazards in healthcare facility are never events, but they should never have happened. When they do, we do a root cause analysis to find out what's going wrong. And we are a um, culture of safety, for sure. Safety hazards in the healthcare facility, number one, falls. Alarm fatigue, getting sick of those nuisance alarms. Equipment-related accidents, fire, electrical, restraints, and mercury poisoning. So mercury poisoning used to come from thermometers. Now our thermometers aren't mercury-related. Another clicker check, when implementing the use of restraints on a hospitalized patient, you should restrain all confused patients so they don't sustain an injury, tie the restraint to the bottom side rail so that the client cannot reach it, ensure the patient care provider renews the order at least once every 24 hours, or release once every shift. So it's obviously C, they need to be or he ordered every 24 hours. Some safety hazards for healthcare workers include back injury, needle stick injury, radiation injury, violence and the prevention of those things, use of body mechanics, sharps awareness, proper disposal of sharps, radiation precautions, and environmental awareness of personal safety. So how would you as a Nurse, support the culture of safety. Select all that apply. Complete incident reports when appropriate, yes. Complete incident reports for a near miss, yes. Communicate product concerns to an immediate supervisor, yes. Identify the person responsible for an incident, eh, not necessarily. It's not as important to identify the person responsible as for why. Okay. Socratic reasoning. Um, so do you think teamwork and collaboration is an important um, in assuring the culture of safety? Absolutely. Assessment. We're always assessing the client's home, their environment, their risk for safety, their risk for violence. And you can see examples in the nursing diagnosis, such as use of the diagnosis at risk for injury. The outcomes um, depend on the nursing diagnosis and the interventions, assessing, educating, evaluating, removing hazards using technology, 
establishing goals, reporting accidents, and considering the patients as a member of the healthcare team. Home safety interventions that we provide, preventing poison, education around carbon monoxide poisoning, home fires, scalds, burns, falls, firearm injuries, and preventing suffocation. How to perform choking rescue, how to perform um, life sustaining measures when someone's drowning, and take home toxins. Teaching for safety self-care, motor vehicle safety, food safety, for fighting vector-borne illnesses, reducing palm pollution, um, weather hazard safety measures. Preventing falls, reducing electrical hazards, responding to fires, preventing the need for restraints, responding to mercury spills or chemotherapy spills, keeping your equipment safe, reducing alarm fatigue, coping with violence. And then in delegation, we always wanna be sure that we're not delegating things that they can't do around restraints. Make sure that you're not delegating things that you must do. And we'll talk more about delegation in a little bit. 